Hello, everyone. Welcome to the .CMS Fall Product Webinar. I'm Todd Bennett from .CMS, and presenting today is our CTO and founder, Willie Zell. Will is going to update you a bit on our company and show you what we've been working on these past few months. We hope you'll stick around to the end because we're excited to show off some of the new features we're working on. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll answer those at the end. The webinar is being recorded and we'll provide you with a link to the recording when it's over. And with that, here's Will. Thank you, Todd. And hello, everyone. Uh, this is the .CMS Fall Update for 2022. Um, we have been doing these now for about five years, twice a year, um, and I really enjoy doing them, but I got to say this is going to be the last one that I'm going to do alone. I think that uh, we, next time, we'll have other players here that we'll talk through uh, different different pieces of the organization and different pieces of uh, what, what we're doing within the .CMS tool. My name, again, is Will Ezel, and I'm the CTO and co-founder here at .CMS, and I oversee the engineering and the product teams um, and work with uh, the different uh, different uh, departments in our organization to steer the product uh, based upon what we're seeing in the marketplace and based on what, what we're hearing from our current customers. Uh, before I kick off, I'd like to talk a little bit about the company. I like talking about the company. Um, as a founder, it's, uh, it, it gives me a warm feeling in my heart, but I think that the good news here is we're still experiencing year over year recurring revenue growth. Um, and and I think as a company, we're committed to profitability. And I think that that commitment to profitability is a little bit different than many SaaS companies who have raised money. Um, while we were acquired last year, it wasn't really a money raise. Um, it was much more of um, bringing in new leadership to come in and take the company to the next level. And our focus on profitability, I, I think, um, it is part of uh, the security play. I mean, it's, it's part of our stability as a company. This has been, you know, we've been profitable for, I don't know, seven years in a row. and you know, continuing to grow and build on that profitability, I think, is a in where we are from a current from a macroeconomic standpoint. Currently, is a, is a, is a really compelling strategy. Um, over the past year, we've made a number of key hires, um, not the least of which is uh, our new director of cybersecurity, Mehdi Karimi. Uh, he's a PhD, has a PhD in cybersecurity, and is going to come in and oversee all of our cybersecurity initiatives um, within the company. We've also brought in Damon Gillen, who's a, a new product manager, um, and he's going to uh, work with the teams in order to shape the product and the product direction. And we've also hired a new product designer, Melissa Rojas, um, who's going to focus on the UI and the usability of what we're doing and what we're building. Um, and, you know, last but not least, engineers. Like, we've hired a, a number of engineers in, in, in just about every different department, from support to professional services, QA, and R&D. Um, and, you know, that, that we're still hiring. Um, so if you go to, if you're interested in working with us, please go to our site, take a look at our open uh, jobs, uh, or reach out to any one of us and, and let us know your interest because we uh, we need engineers and we need basically just about every department. So um, we'd be happy to talk to you as well. So one thing that I think we've come up with as a company is that how foundational security and the security of what we're doing in our platform is, um, you know, we are... We just received, I think, in the beginning of November, our, our, I'm sorry, in the beginning of October, our SOC 2 Type 2 certification for 2022, and it had no exceptions in it. Uh, you know, this is a huge achievement for us as a company. Um, this is something that we're going to be doing year over year. Um, and, you know, when bringing in Medi to come in and oversee our cybersecurity, he was like, well, I'm coming in and you guys have already started with SOC 2. You know, that's a great start because a lot of times, generally, he comes in organizations and sees them working up to SOC 2. But I think we're going to we're going to build on that um, security and um, really take security to the next level with us as a company, which includes getting certified for data privacy. It includes ISO 27001 certification, uh, becoming a CVE authority. So um, CVEs are uh, you know alerts of vulnerabilities found within different software, and has really become the de facto way that um, companies communicate vulnerabilities to their customers. And um, becoming our own CVE authority means that we can write our own CVE numbers and publish those out. Um, right now, we have to go to a CVE authority and, and request a CVE number for when a vulnerability is found. But it's going to really help the communication process, I think, between us and our customers in, um, in defining and um, communicating about vulnerabilities. Um, 
setting up vulnerability and bug bounty programs. This is uh, we we do and have paid bug bounties and vulnerability bounties before. We just don't have a formal program. Um, and this is this would be setting up a formal program that we could we could um, we could publish and people could engage with and, and security researchers can engage with. Um, and that's something that I think we're happy to do. To be honest with you, it's a uh, when, when it's always when we get a, a vulnerability report and it gets verified, it's always like, well, I'm glad that was found by a security researcher. So, um, you know, there's a number of different practices that we're taking on within the organization from security training for all of our, um, for all of our employees and as well as doing things like, uh, you know, taking security coding, uh, security coding, secure coding, um, courses for all of our developers. Um, and so these initiatives that are here uh, are just the start of, of what we're going to be doing um, with regard to security. So setting that aside, I want to talk also a little bit about our road mapping process. Um, interesting, I was uh, listening to a podcast um, from the woman who started uh, ProdPad, which is a, a product management platform. Um, and she's actually the woman that came up with the idea of uh, a road map methodology that breaks down what's now, what's next, and what's later. Um, and what she found when she was building ProdPad is she started out building it, and it was a Gantt chart, and the roadmap looked like a Gantt chart. So it looked like this is going to be worked on, and this is going to be worked on with an end date. This is going to be worked on. And her customers were using that and liked it, but they had a, a, a funny question. They said, okay, we have all of this in a Gantt chart. What we need to do is move everything over one month, not one thing, but everything over one month. And what she found was that inevitably, um, well, she thought that she was, that she had a problem delivering software features on time. And inevitably, what she found is that within organizations of all different stripes, um, they were, organizations were struggling to deliver on time. And she found that a, a better methodology for delivering roadmap was to break things up into what's being worked on now. Um, and that's something that, you know, those are things are in development. Um, probably going to come out within the, the next, you know, one to one to five months, and then take a look at what's being worked on next. And this is this is what comes next after what's being worked on now. Probably going to be delivered within the next three to eight months. And then finally, there's a bucket called later, which is ideas that still require more prioritization and planning. Um, and those are generally nine to twelve months away. And if you think about it, it's kind of like a you know a hurricane's cone of probability, right? This is what what we're working on now is is what we can pinpoint. This is where we are currently with our with our current teams. What we're working on next becomes a little bit little bit fuzzier. It's much more locked in, but finally what becomes what we're working on later um, can can shift around based upon requirements and needs that we see in the marketplace and that we hear from our customers. So all of our product ideas get filtered and funneled into a tool called pro, called Product Board. Um, and this this includes features that come from all that comes from current customers, they come from what we see in RFPs, what, what sales hears, and all of those go into a scoring process where they're scored for um, basically their, their reach, impact, and attainability. And um, you know we use that to prioritize the issues and to prioritize what we're working on, what's gonna be coming next, what's gonna be coming later, right? And this, is a, this results in a public roadmap, right? And you can come to our www at any point, .cms.com, and go to the roadmap, and you're going to be, you know, given the, an inter interactive roadmap that talks about now, next, and later. And if you come to what's in development now, you can see exactly what we're working on and what's in development now. If you come to see what's prioritized next, you can see what what we have in the pipeline. And then finally, what's coming after that. This is a, a, a fuzzier bucket, a bigger bucket, but these are ideas that we're thinking about working on within the product, right? So this is a, a, a public URL, um, and you can get to it right from our site. Um, Another important link here that I ask everyone or anyone who's interested, oops, anyone who's interested is send emails to productfeedback at .com. Um, any ideas or any improvements um, that you think are important, those get dropped into our planning bucket to get prioritized, just like any idea that we come up with. Um, so all feedback is welcome there. You can also, from the, from the roadmap, um, interactive roadmap portal, you can submit an idea right here. Um, this is almost doing the same thing as sending an email to that email address. So let me talk a little bit about, before we get to what we're working on next, I want to talk about um, release 2210. Release just came out, um, and it is 
planned to be our new LTS version. Uh, the big reason for 2210 and the, and the big news in 2210, and I've talked about this in, in previous uh, in previous roadmaps, but um, the, the most important component in 2210 is the idea of the block editor and the delivery of the block editor. And we had it before; it was in beta, um, but in 2210, it's it's gone gold. And you know, the block editor I think is an important new component in our content management arsenal, and I think we're going to continue building into it um, and making it a, a a richer, maybe the de facto place where rich content should be edited in .tmask. The reason why it is replacing our current um, WYSIWYG is that it works both in a headless world and it also works in traditional implementation. So when you make edits within the block editor, it's actually storing that as a JSON object um, under the covers. And so when you go and get the piece of content from in a headless perspective, you can parse that JSON and spit that out and drop that into a component and have that component um, deliver that content um, any way that you see fit. Um, the same thing works within a velocity context. So in our block editor implementation, we have a method in, a tr in, a, in velocity called 2HTML, which will take a, uh, the block editor, the JSON of the block editor, and format it just like it would be formatted you know, if you were using a traditional WYSIWYG. And you can see that on our demo site. So if I come to our demo site, and take a look at um, this blog entry. Um, you can see here, you know, it's a it's a rich text. Um, it has different sections, um, and it is being fully delivered by the block editor. So if I come to the back end and take a look at the blogs, and come down to the bottom, you can see here, this is the block editor. This is what is being spit out. Um, onto this particular page. Now, the very cool thing about the block editor is that you can embed different content within this content block, right? So the block editor gives you the ability to reorder blocks, right? Which is why it is called the block editor. But it also gives you the ability, let's say I want to add, um, I won't add it there, that will look bad. Why don't I add it here? I can come and select content of, let's say I want to drop a, uh, a product right here. Um, so let's say I want to drop a snorkel. This piece of content here, if I go ahead and save and publish, this is actually a reference to this piece of content that is coming out of that JSON. What you can do in your component that is, that's rendering this is you can say, oh, okay, so here they drop the product in here, and you can drop a rich component into the middle of your, your block editor. Right, and this works headlessly. It also works, um, or I'm sorry, it works in a traditional CMS. It also works headlessly. So if I come to this demo spa.tms.com, this is our example SPA uh, that is built using the same data as the demo site. So the demo site is powering both uh, a traditional implementation. It's also powering a Next.js based implementation. This demo SPA is actually hosted on Vercel. Um, so it's not even we're not even hosting our our own demo SPA. But if I come, you can see here to the, that blog entry, and you can see. Let me scroll down. Let me refresh this so it'll pick up the changes. And you can see here I just dropped a product, and this dropped a product component right in the middle of uh, right in the middle of that block. So using this in this way, you can build components to do things like let's say I want to do a um, a video, a YouTube video. Right. Oops. Uh, YouTube video. I can pick a YouTube video and drop it right here in the middle of it, and that's going to drop that piece of content and all this, the metadata and information around that piece of content into the middle of the JSON object. Right. And you can reorder this, move it up and down, what have you. I don't know if we have a video component. Um, then what you need is a video component that's actually going to deliver that video to the front end. Um, I don't have a video component there, but let me let me show you an example of, uh, of another component. Like you can just drag and drop images right onto um, right onto a given block. So if I want to say I'm going to upload this image, I can publish that image and come back and take a look. 
and it's going to drop that image right in the middle of the block. It'll do that both um, there. It will also do that in the headless implementation as well. Once Vercel refreshes, Vercel takes a second to refresh. So all of that can be dragged and dropped. You can also add um, to your video, you can add things like uh, captions, um, alt tags as well. So it makes it very easy, um, very easy to, to, to build this a, a rich content object that is fully manageable by, by your end users, but you have also full control of it on um, when when that control is rendered. So jumping back, um, jumping back to what we've done with the block editor, another feature that we've added is the ability to convert WYSIWYG. Oops, convert. Mm -hmm. to convert WYSIWYG type content to use block editor. Okay, so now this is for uh, traditional implementation. You can come to an existing, let's call it this rich text, and take a look at this rich text. This is the old school WYSIWYG, right? What I can come and do on the demo site is I can come to my content type and say, let's, let's create a new content type. Um, and I'm going to create a title, and I'm going to create a WYSIWYG here. So this is as I build that one thing, a couple niceties here. We've added the ability to take any content type and do two things. One, you can make an exact copy of the content type. I can say copy and I can give it a new content type name and a variable and it will automatically create a copy of that content type. Um, that makes it really easy to, to duplicate content types. The other thing I can do is I can add this content type specifically to a menu item. And so I can say here, I want to create a menu item called rich, test rich text, okay? And let's add it under this content tab. And I can choose what view I want to default to with that as a list view. And what that's done is it's added this new content tool here that is specifically built for rich text, right? That's specifically built for that particular content type. And that's how we built all of these different, you know, content specific, um, content specific uh, menu items there. It just makes it very easy when you're, when you're delivering a site uh, for your end users to be able to, to give them specific places they know if they want to go and edit blogs, they come and click on blogs. But back to our example, um, let me go ahead and take a, I'm gonna go ahead and drop rich text in here. Here is a test. All right, I'm gonna publish that. And what I can do is I can come to the content type now, and if I take a look at the WYSIWYG, it's gonna give me this option down here, which says, um, the block editor field will allow you to, you can switch it to a block editor field. Now, it, it doesn't, it's not quite um, automatic. Like we're not going under the covers and rewriting the content of the given field to JSON. Instead, what we're doing is when you come back and you edit a, anything that was in, that was built in a WYSIWYG, we're gonna render it inside the block editor. Okay. and. That's important to know because what it means is that in your display, if you if you do choose to switch uh, your WYSIWYG content to use the block editor, you'll either need to go to each um, each content object and render it here in, in the block editor and go ahead and publish it, or you'll need to, like we've done, um, you'll need to have your implementation be able to handle uh, if this is you have to do you know a switch that says if this is block editor content, format it this way. If it's WYSIWYG content, just spit it out. The good news is we built the tooling in Velocity to make that very simple. So um, the, the, the path to using the new block editor um, is not that difficult. Um, and you can begin to use it and have a, have, you know, a content type that, let's say you have a content type of a thousand blog entries. You can switch the, the field to the block editor and you know, future forward be using the block editor even if you don't go back and, and update your old blog entries, as long as you know you, you're rendering that in Velocity, if it's if it's block editor formatted as a block, otherwise formatted as a as a WYSIWYG. The other thing you can do, and I showed how you can select um, 
the content type to include, you can whitelist the content types that you want to show in that list. So here you can see if I come here and I, I take a look at the contents, this is showing every piece of content. You can build a whitelist and say, I only want to allow blogs to be added to this particular piece of content. Right. And you can also whitelist these, these blocks. So let's say you don't want to allow a code block or a horizontal line or a block quote, whatever. This can be all whitelisted um, down to the down to the exact blocks that you want to allow. Right. In in truth, the block editor field in an interesting use case, the block editor field could be a stand in for um, for or a lightweight kind of relationship type field where you could have a block editor where all the user can do is link content. Um, and then when you're rendering that in your component, you just get the content link and do with it what you will. Um, but we give you the control to control the entire block editor. You can you can control the, the styling, uh, the CSS of the block editor, as well as the blocks that are available. Um, and, and you know the images are are very easy to drag and drop and very easy to manage under the covers. You can pop open a you know a, a file, drop it. Um, you can also cut and paste an image. So if you have, you can go to like um, just come to Google Images and search for snowboarding. Let's say I want to take this image. I can come here. I can copy the image to my clipboard and come and say, delete that image and say here, I'm going to paste that image into my block editor and it'll paste that image right into the block editor. This is actually taking that image and creating a, an asset in .tms for that particular image, right? So what's coming next with regard to, so, so we see the block editor is foundational um, and what's coming next for the, the block editor, um, things that, to include things like word and character counts. So all over the internet, you see time to read. Um, well, in word and character counts, um, this is coming in, in, you know, the next, um, I think the next version, but um, that's all going to be embedded in your content block. So um, when you're rendering your content block, you'll have access to the word count, the character count, and the time it would take to read that. Um, you won't have to go and recalculate that. We're also going to be updating new media and image controls. Um, this is an important one. Uh, I showed a little bit about, like, including a video. Um, we didn't have the components to, to, to render that video. And you can include video now, but this is going to be very uh, a bespoke um, video control that'll allow you to, um, to to view the video in line, things like that, as well as image controls, things like inline image editing, um, and having a bit more control about how the the image is actually rendered or is referenced in your block. Right. Another big thing that the block editor doesn't have is support for tables. Uh, so it's interesting. I think one thing to note in doing the conversion from uh, from your WYSIWYG to um, the block editor. If the block editor doesn't understand the HTML that you put into it, for example, tables, um, or you know, if you have inline styles or things like that, the block editor is going to rip that out. Um, so be mindful in converting um, WYSIWYG. If you have things like tables, or you have you know JavaScript code in your you know if you're looking at the source code and you've embedded JavaScript, the, the block editor is going to rip that out actually. Um, but all that said, it, it provides, I think, a, a, a much better end-user experience than our current WYSIWYG, and we're just going to continue building into it. So putting the block editor aside and talking a little bit more about what's in uh, 2210, there are a ton of other improvements. Um, I showed how you can copy content types and how you can add, you know, with one click, you can add the, the content type to a, to a, a menu item. Um, but we've also worked, at, you know, at all different levels, things like, OSGI restarts. Um, OSGI restarts are much cleaner now. They don't. Um, we've reduced our dependence on fragments. You know, it's a little bit technical, but basically, they, they restart uh, without having. You can you can upload a, a plugin, and it's not going to have to restart the whole OSGI framework. Uh, we also have uh, pre-render I/O support. So if you're delivering, um, you know, headlessly, or you're de de delivering sites that um, do remote calls to pull in content before they're rendered, pre-render I/O. What that does is it will go and uh, it's basically built for SEO for sites that are dynamically rendered. Um, so if pre-render IO sees and dot, the .tms plugin sees like a, the Google bot coming in to index a page, it will basically deliver a pre-rendered version of that page where all the JavaScript is already executed um, for Google to be able to index. Um, so it gives Google much better, your index results or your, your SEO results um, can be much improved 
if you are doing a bunch of you know remote uh, content retrieval to build your pages. Um, another nice thing is we have, and this I'm, I don't know, if we haven't made enough hay about this. I want to make some hay about it. We have a Swagger API Playground built in. Okay, so this is important for developers, um, but you can come here to the API Playground and basically get a uh, playground where you can interact directly with all of the different um, all of the different APIs that are available in .CMS. So I'm not sure why that's not loading. But let me show you what that looks like. I'm running locally as well. Um, API Playground. So this is basically, this is being generated by all of our REST endpoints. And you can see here each of the different REST endpoints and the different methods that they support, um, as well as the different parameters that they're expecting. So for example, if you take a look at um, this particular endpoint, it's taking a post um, and it's taking a JSON object that looks something like that. Um, and you can actually try these out here within the tool. Um, it's a very powerful way. It allows you know, your developers to, to discover, you know, we have a ton of APIs in .CMS that are built out, you know, page APIs, content type APIs, all different content delivery. I mean, you can interact with just about anything. And, you know, I think our documentation has been limited on a lot of these different APIs. This surfaces all of the APIs. Um, so your developers can come in here and experiment and, and play around and find the APIs that they're, they're looking for. I think it's a really important uh, feature in the tool. Um, the new SAS compiler, um, we were using lib lib uh, SAS, which actually went, um, which actually was a, a close project. Um, now we've embedded Dart SAS, which is a, a modern, up-to-date SAS compiler, super fast, and it works really well. So that's what's in in, in 2210. Um, you know, really the block editor is foundational um, for for what we're doing with content management, and we're going to continue to build into it. But what's next with .CMS? Um, and by what's next? This is what we are actually working on um, in the tool, right? And one thing that we've heard again and again for new customers is when they log into a .CMS instance, they um, don't know what to do. Um, and you know, let's say I want I'm a new user and I want to create a page. Well, there's no page component here. There's no place right now to come and click on pages and get a list of pages, right? And a lot of um, a lot of marketing teams are coming from WordPress or whatever, where you know everything's a page. And the idea of structured content is, is different. So you have to train them to come to the browser and come to the folder and right click and do a new. And that's, you know, that's a, a, a painful thing. Um, and additionally, if you're a, an editor using the tool, you know, you just want to log in and be able to double click on a, or not even double click, single click on, um, you know, a page that you favorited and just be taken directly to that page and begin editing that page. Well, that's what this is. That's what this is. This is really a page management um, a, a portlet where you can come to pages and you can you can star different pages and you can star different pages in different languages or the same page in different languages. So um, you can say, okay, I want this to be my favorite page. And what that's going to do is drop a, a favorites onto this page management where you can, you know, just click on it and be taken directly to edit mode um, for that particular page. Or if you wanted to use it as like a template, you could you could right click on it um, and say, you know, copy this page and you can make a copy of the page exactly and be taken to edit mode instantly for the copy of that page. Um, so it's really trying to streamline the flow of the page management um, and, and, and make pages much more, um, as, as, as marketers expected, much more accessible rather than having to come to the browser and double click and right click and all of that stuff. Another piece that's in full flight right now um, are experiments um, in A-B testing. Um, we have, we're in the process of building out, um, we have all the infrastructure um, built out, inspect in, um, and we have the entire flow of the, the application designed and how that's gonna work. And it's really modeled after best in breed, um, you know, Google optimized type experiments. Um, and it's just gonna be built into every given page. So you're going to be able to browse to a given page. And let me take a look. Browse to a page, and there's just going to be an experiment button, right? And you're going to be taken, when you click on the experiment button, you know, 
here's your list of experiments running on this page. Do you want to add a new experiment? And it's going to pop out and fly out, and it'll all be interactive um, here. The, the, the beauty of it is that it's not going to take you out of your flow, um, and you're going to be able to create a page variant, be able to you know, change what's on that page variant, and then monitor the results. Um, and we, we're using a Bayesian uh, model for predictive results. Um, Bayesian, the, the, the benefit of that over, you know, just uh, just saying, you know, which page is winning is that it'll it'll give you relevant results with a much smaller data set. Um, so we can do things like we want to use, you know, the, the Bayesian predictive results and say, okay, if this page, if this variant of the experiment is winning, we want to start sending more and more traffic to it, and we'll be able to do that on a, on a faster basis with with Bayesian results. Um, so the UI is currently in flight. Um, you know, you'll be able to select your objectives, and it's going to be a, a URL or an event-based objective. So if you want to, like, say, any time a button is pressed or something like that, um, you can use an event-based objective as well. Um, so, so this is in full flight. I, we're expecting a, a MVP probably in Q1. Um, so hopefully we'll get there before that, um, but it is November. So another piece that we're working on um, is Zapier integration. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what Zapier is, it's a an API that you can integrate with that has integrations with just about every you know cloud or SaaS based tool on the internet. Um, so if you integrate, if, you know, with the Zapier integration, you'll be able to say, you know, when this piece of content is published, um, send a notification to Slack. Or so you can you can send uh, events to Zapier, but you can also receive events from Zapier, right? And so you we could have a a, a Zap that would be, you know, monitor this Google Sheet. Um, and when a new row is added, add the uh, at, as the same as a piece of content within .tms. So you could actually be managing content within your .tms system from Google Sheets. Um, so it's a, it's a really powerful tool. Um, and you know, with with Zapier integration, it's going to be easy to say that we integrate basically with anything at that point, um, because Zapier does integrate with, with just about all all the different major SaaS tools on the internet. And Work in progress is uh, the .tma CLI, and this would be the .tma CLI 2.0, I guess. Um, you know, we have an example of a CLI right now that's written as Bash script, and this is available in our repo. And the idea is that you can push content types, and you can push folders, and languages, and assets, and DTLs, and templates, and containers, um, all using the command line. This is being we're taking the CLI out of Bash and, and moving it into Quarkus, and what Quarkus is is a micro um, micro framework that enables um, enables you to write Java that actually can be compiled down to binaries that, that are executable on uh, all different platforms. Um, in this process, we're also redefining and making more friendly some of our APIs. You know, our APIs are very verbose. So when you look at a content type, um, you know, what, what putting a content type looks like, um, you know, you're like, wow, I really need all these fields. Well, you don't actually. And that's what we're trying to, we're trying to make these APIs very developer friendly. Um, and, uh, and it's something that we're going to be building on. So the CLI can be interactive. You can run it interactively. So you can choose a target environment. You can get an authorization from that target environment. You're going to be able to pull um, sites, content types, and all of that, just like you're going to be able to push it. So it'll be a two-way sync, um, which should be the foundation for, you know, .cma CICD uh, type of operation. So that was what was next. Looking ahead is what's later. Um, you know, I think one thing that we've talked about and I think is a, a really important piece, and we see this again and again with our customers, um, is, is to have some guidance when you're building a page in .cms, right? You can build your page in .cms, but you don't have any sense of the page's performance. Uh, you don't have any sense of the page's accessibility. We had an accessibility checker built in. It was built in into the WYSIWYG um, versus it at the page level. Um, this is going to be built at the page level, and the idea is that we'll have another um, accessibility SEO report or page performance, um, or page audit, I guess maybe we'll call it, where you would click here and actually be able to run a Lighthouse report. Um, it might not be Lighthouse, it might be another tool, but actually run a report right on your given page. Right, and I know you can do this now, I know, but I don't think it's built into people's flows in terms of managing pages and content in .tms. I think it would be a very powerful thing to be able to say, I just made changes to this page. I want to run a, uh, a page audit on make sure I didn't break anything in terms of performance for the given page. And you know another piece that, that is later, and, and this is 
a hugely important. I mean, this is foundational and fundamental to us. Is the is the revamping of the content search and the content edit screen. Um, right now, those screens are, um, you know, the core of where people live in the system, and we, you know, we need to update those to be to be uh, much more modern, much more uh, performant, um, and uh, you know, do so in a way without where we're not going to break um, people's current implementations, right? And that's our challenge. It's not we're not starting Greenfield here. It's you know we're we're having we know we have to come in and support um, things like uh, custom fields and custom fields that are written in velocity, which is going to be a challenge in a single page app. Um, and but this is stuff that we're taking into consideration when when redoing all of this. Some other initiatives that we're taking on um, from a from a cloud perspective um, is we're right now um, .2 Cloud runs on AWS. We're moving into the idea where .2 Cloud can also be run on GCP. Um, and this is a, a work in progress, um, but it's an exciting development. I think that um, that being able to, to provide a, a cloud um, at, in different uh, public cloud providers, I think is important. Customers have existing relationships with cloud providers or, or um, comfort levels with different providers and want to be able to run .2 Cloud. They just don't want to run it in AWS. Um, and for whatever reason, and so being able to offer different cloud providers providers would be a, a, a really nice piece. And then finally, the idea of global content labels. Uh, this we used to call this categories, um, but the idea being of, of of using labels as the primary means of slicing and dicing content up. Um, this is you know the ability to to bulk tag and to bulk um, categorize content. The idea that these categories would actually be content unto themselves, which can have, you know, supporting metadata around them. And um, this is something we've talked about, um, and it's something that's still still on our roadmap. And that's it. And I thank you guys for your time. Uh, all ideas are welcome. Again, this product feedback at .tms.com goes right into our product management workflow. And we'd love to hear from you all. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, everyone.